Hi, 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 McCartney fans, and welcome to episode 107 of Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. We are a Paul McCartney talk show, mainly dealing with the solo career of Paul McCartney. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Tom Hunyadi, and you may know me from my other show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast where we talk all things solo Beatles. And I am joined by my partner in crime, my backwards traveler. He is the, the man behind the curtain, if you will, the technician of the show. It's Andy Nichols. Andy, what's going on, my friend? On remote location and doing well. <laughs> good 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 how's everything all's well yeah great to be here again and we have another awesome guest lined up here to join us on two legs today i am really excited about our guest today on um, i mean an amazingly long career and a very respected drummer uh, our guest today is, is a drumming legend uh, he's um the longtime drummer of the of the excellent band fairport convention uh, he has recorded and uh, toured with such legends as Elton John, Jimmy Page, X XTC, Jethro Tull, George Harrison, and obviously our boy Paul McCartney. And he is the one and only Dave Maddox. Dave, what's going on? Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you asking me uh, um, to be on your your show. You've obviously had some uh, quite incredible guests on over the over the over the period you've been doing this. So I'm I'm flattered to be joining these these esteemed folk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Um, you know, unfortunately, where we are in life today, uh, we, I guess a lot of us have a little bit more time on our hands. Uh, things aren't going uh, accordingly uh, right now, but, but how's life been uh, this past year for, for you? Well, like most of my peers, it pretty much ground to a halt mm. halfway through uh, March. In fact, my last um, my last live gig was the day after my birthday on March the 14th. Okay. And that was the last time I played out live. But um, between uh, looking after my <laughs> my now sparkling equipment, uh, which, which collection, which is which is quite large. And uh, I've also been doing a little bit of teaching. Uh, I've also been doing some production work um, and I've also been uh, doing a little bit of remote recording, which is typically myself and a recording engineer. And then once in a while, the artist as well. And it's not my favorite way of making music, but A, I know how to do it and B, it beats not playing. <laughs> and myself and my wife, She's working, she's very busy working from home and we have two Jack Russells and ah. the four of us are doing well and doing the sensible thing and praying some, praying for a return to sense in the next gotcha. few days. But okay. uh, we won't go down that path. At, on <laughs> no, we're not, yes, this no. is not that show. <laughs> so. Not that show. <laughs> But uh, but to start off with, let's let's just talk about you for for a moment. And uh, I mean, you didn't start off as a drummer, did you? No. Um, a, a, apparently, I sat down at a piano age six and started playing it. Right. And then it went from there, and then I mistakenly, at the age of I think it was about twelve or thirteen, thought that the drums would be easier. And it's been downhill rapidly ever since then. So, uh, but so, um, I'm well, hanging in there. <laughs> so, what what then was it about the drums, or who, or did you discover a drummer that you thought was amazing to? I don't. Like, you want to I pick don't those know, sticks up. I don't know what it was. Um, like most of my peer group, um, there was a there was a band that was influential um, in those very very early years in my uh, very early teens. And they were kind of like the UK equivalent of the Ventures, mm. a band called The Shadows. Okay. And, yep. and, and every schoolboy who had aspirations of playing an instrument, or certainly a guitar or a bass or a drum kit, wanted to be in The Shadows. And that was, that was the start of it. And then it just, uh, then it just right. went from there. Uh, you're a big jazz fan, right? Yeah, I am. Um, I am a big jazz fan. Uh, and I wouldn't have the audacity to call myself a jazz musician because I have too much respect for those people. But I know, 
but I know how to play it and I, I continue to play it well, well, up until this March, I, right. <laughs> I continue to play it and I've done a few records and yes, I, I, am, a, I am a jazz fan. But um, cliche time, I'm, a, I'm just a fan of, of good music, really. Okay. And everyone's got their own idea of what that, that is. But yes. you know, mine is different or the same as yours or anybody else's. But that's what I just gravitate towards. But it's, 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 it's relatively broad. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it goes back to, you know, in, with drummers, everything from Baby Dodds right through to Paul Motion and, and beyond. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big take on, on jazz, yeah. Gotcha. So let's, let's jump into a, a Fairport convention because I like to consider myself a, a music fan uh -huh. and, uh, and consider myself a person that listens to a lot of music. And when I started doing research, you know, on your career, I must confess, Fairport wasn't something that I had heard before and I was kind of excited to jump into that and what I heard was really amazing and I'm very glad that uh, I've discovered this music now and really impressed by you know what you were able to bring to the to the table on that but let's talk about joining a band or replacing a member of a band that's already been kind of established and then here you are now joining this band and I mean how did that atmosphere how was that atmosphere at the time and how did that make you feel joining a band after the the previous drummer had, had passed it I was in the band for about six to nine months before it really hit me okay. uh, and it was but the people in the band were and are, I mean, there's a couple that have passed away, mm -hmm. but the ones that are in the band and are still in the band, I'm not in the band anymore. I left in, right. 19, yes. I left in 97, but those people were incredibly kind to me, very, very accommodating. And I credit them with changing my perception and how I heard music. Mm -hmm. I, before them, I was very involved and very taken up with technique and they opened my ears and made me look at the bigger picture. Let's, let's, let's be, you know, with, with, I mean, I could elaborate a lot, but without, I don't want to send your listeners into a deep coma. So <laughs> let's, 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 just, let's just say they had a profound effect upon how I heard music and how I listened to music and the, the music that appealed to me. I started, after I was in the band for about nine months uh, yeah. or so, it was, uh, it was quite a change. And it, 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 I, I owe them a lot because I, I, it, made them, it made me appreciate music more and in a different kind of way. I started looking, I started to be less aware of how clever somebody was and more looking at the larger picture. Um, mm. When, just before I joined the band, I was playing in a kind of a Lawrence Welk type of band. Mm -hmm. Very, very different. And my knowledge of anything vaguely folky was Peter, Paul and Mary and some very woolly sweaters and people with their fingers in the air. I had no idea that the kind of music that Fairport had subsequently got into, which was brackets, taking English traditional music and kind of dragging it, kicking and screaming into the 20th century. I had no idea about that music at all. I, I, and so it was, as I began to understand it and, and uh, look into it, it, it was a revelation for me. Gotcha. So um, the album, the two albums that I, I've picked up recently, the, you know, the first two that you performed on as a full fledged member, the Legion, um, and Legion. The Leaf, Leaf and then, you know, Full House, which I definitely recommend. Um, I'm really liking Full House a lot. Uh, I'm really liking the, the progression of the band. Um, you know, I love Sandy's vocals, you know, on that, on that, for, and then the Leaf and Leaf, Le or Legion Leaf, but um what the band became, you know, afterwards, I, I'm really just blown away just about the unity of the band and uh, just the whole, even the vocals, I, I really enjoy on that. So, but you, but, but from that until, like you said, you left in 96, you were on and off with that band, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I did 69 to 74 mm -hmm. and then it was driving me the politics, not so much the band politics. I just felt we were, and again, I'm sure you've heard variations on this, a lot before felt like I was in terms of getting somewhere 
um, banging my head against the wall. We were all getting 50 pounds a week. Wow. And, and by th at that time, around about 74, I was starting to freelance a lot. Right. And I was really enjoying the music that I was asked to play. I was earning a, a decent wage finally. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't bear it with the, we, just felt like we were, we were because we were never, the band was never big in the way, kind of like a, uh, a yes or a Jethro Tull or that it, we were never never that big because people just didn't get it I mean what we d what the band did was uh, from an aesthetic point of view just a brief description for those who aren't familiar we decided up until the point where I joined the band was predominantly known as playing singer-songwriter music kind of covering Americans American singer songwriters, the Joni Mitchells, who were then right. not that well known. And the band, the Fairports, decided that, that doing that music was best left to the Americans. And why don't we come up with some kind of, you know, sounds a bit pretentious, but it does, it's not meant to be indigenous English music, and we'll put our own spin on it without any kind of flag waving bullshit or anything like that. It was just, we wanted to come up with something our own, of our own. And I think that's what we did, but it didn't, it never really caught on. People, I remember doing one of my fa favorite recollections, which I've quoted often, was we were halfway through a gig at UCLA, um, uh, open air gig in the, in the afternoon. It was a big crowd. And we were playing the jigs and reels and we were playing these murder ballads and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And some wag shouted out, play some rock and roll. And Richard Thompson went up to the microphone and he said, we are, we're playing English rock and roll. Mm. <laughs> gotcha. But it never, but it just never really, people didn't, you know, hey, what, what, what are those guys singing about? What's that strain accent, accent they're singing in? Because most English bands you know saying an american accent yeah i mean the, the the thing that has always amused us in the fairport camp and the wider thing is is that the english people who when you have a conversation with them it's kind of you know oh yeah mate well you know fantastic i really really did and then they open their mouth to sing and it's yeah baby <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's always been that's always been a, a source of much amusement to us and we we just tried to come up with with something that that was that was more ours mm. so yeah. dave you, you mentioned uh being a big jazz fan at heart i was wondering in your career has it ever crossed paths with uh bill bruford of yes you mentioned yes oh uh, yeah yeah, Bill. Bill and I know each other quite well. With with the bands that were on festivals together, and obviously, kind of the, the drummer thing. We've we've passed, you know. We we we've we've talked about that kind of stuff. No, I, I I'm full of admiration for Bill. Um, not only is he a great drummer, but he's another one of those wonderful human beings, who, with all due respect, <laughs> without naming names. Um, pricks the bubble of the popular conception of the drummer as a long head hooligan who hits things. Mm. And I, I've, I've always loved that about Bill. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's very bright. He's very eloquent. And, 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 and on top of that, he's an absolutely fantastic drummer. Yeah, mm. yeah he is. I, I was curious and I knew probably Fairport had crossed paths with yes at some point, maybe. And that's probably where you guys had had a chance to interact. So I was pretty, that was pretty cool to see. Yeah, at that uh, the, the, some festivals back in the day where both bands were on the bill, and also Bill and I crossed paths in the drum world. He heard um, he heard a jazz thing that I'd made in England in the back end of the nineties, mm. and called me up and wanted to know the, how to get hold of a sax player and mm. a bass player or something, and so we, that kind of exchange. So yeah, we we know each other. I wouldn't say we're bosom buddies, but we're certainly friends and know each other well enough yeah. to have that kind of exchange. Gotcha. So you, you, you touched upon the, the, the freelance thing becoming, you know, now, I guess, a, a sessions drummer then now here, uh -huh. in, you know, in 74 and into the into the seventies. Now, I mean, talk about that change of pace now. I mean, obviously, you're coming in, you're learning the music, you're playing to the song. Is it, it's, is it as creative as being in a band and in the studio or is it a whole, just a whole nother thing? Well, the freelance thing started for me relatively early after joining Fairport. I, I started getting, myself and Dave Pegg, um, the bass player then in Fairport, 
it was either Dave Pegg or Pat Donaldson, who uh, equally wonderful bass player, similar circuit. We we ended up doing a lot of of the kind of the singer songwriter folky things around that time. And then mid seventies, I started getting calls outside of that genre. My friend, um, R.I.P. Gus Dudgeon, who produced yeah. all the Elton stuff, yeah. was one of the first people to call me outside of the folky thing. And that, I think, got me into a... I mean, I wasn't really... It wasn't, it wasn't the way these... <laughs> It's going to sound like an old fart now. It wasn't the way it is these, the, it wasn't the way it is these days where, you know, you do a thesis on Madonna lyrics and you plan your career. You know, I was just playing and, and, enjoy, and enjoying music and I was getting asked to play with this person and that person. And it was, it was illuminating. It was very enjoyable. And, and to more specifically answer that question, it, it, it was what I call, there was sessions and sessions. And by that, I mean, there was the kind of things where you'd roll up and you'd have no idea who it, who it was. And you were not so much churning it out, but it was very much music by rote. You'd have the music and it, it would be 10 to one, two to five and six to nine. And then there were the sessions with, <laughs> you know, when I started getting calls from Gus and people like Glyn Johns to work with Armour Trading and, 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 and uh, obviously George Martin, mm -hmm. completely different kind of thing where you weren't just there to perform a function, you were there to, for your input. It, 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 it's a thing that I gradually learnt over the years that one's reputation kind of goes in front of one of you. We can trust this, but we've heard what this person does and we think we've got a handle on, on, on the way they play. So let's present them with the music and let them get on with it. Mm. As, opposed to, as opposed to having everything either written out or when we get, you know, my, my, the cliche that I sometimes re mm. revert to is, you know, um, yes, when we get to the second bar, I want you to play the fill that goes bum, 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 bum. And then when it gets to the hi-hat thing, I want you to do this and then this. J.R. Robinson, you know who J.R. is? Mm. J.R. Robinson, he's a fantastic yeah. drummer. He played with just about everybody apart from, apart from Paul. Okay. And he tells a great story about somebody doing that to him. I want, you know, when he gets to the third bar, I want you to fill that goes this, and then when, when, he, when he goes to the chorus, I want, but don't do the thing. And he apparently, it's apparently the story, he had one of those people. And he took a step back and he went, you're gonna love what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> so then now jumping from a from a band now into into sessions work uh tell, let's talk about that for a second because i mean it had to have been like a feel like a completely different monster yes or were you able to you know, just jump in and then you, you you play what you play play what they want you to play whereas it's a little different where like you're in a band and everybody gets to create their own instruments uh differently or talk about the the making the switch to freelance drumming I didn't really, again, th give it too much thought because on most of the most of the sessions I was asked to do, the music was presented to me the same way the band would present itself, okay. present music to me, and then it was down to me coming up with something that I thought was appropriate. And and for me, just like working in a band. It wasn't that different from a session in as much as if somebody heard something that they didn't like, mm. um, they'd in a band, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, and then maybe, I wouldn't so much argue, argue, but you discuss it. And it wasn't dissimilar on sessions. I, I'd come up with something and someone would say, yeah, that's cool, but maybe less of that or a bit more here, or I'm not too sure about that idea. And I go, you know, I'm pretty, as you've gathered, <laughs> I'm fairly amenable, so right. you know, I, I, I'm not one of those guys that you know stake in the ground. It's my way or the highway. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and and also because the airports changed my sensibility, I started being much less concerned about me and more about the bigger picture. 
Mm. I think that's a, something that I take, you know, I, I tell students right. that, you know, it, it, you have to have a certain facility and you have to be conscious of how you play and what you play. But that's usually the last thing I'm thinking about. Well, I am thinking about it, but I'm really thinking about where's this song going? Is, is it got this kind of an arc? Right. Is it got that kind of an arc? What's the guitarist doing? What's the singer? What's the story here? Right. You know, is it is it is it fun kind of you know fun or is it serious or you know what's the arc of the song what's what are the instruments doing what's the singer how's the singer singing it, it you know all those kind of things so I would just dial those in the same way I did when I was in the band mm. so it wasn't like a big sideways move for me I I think if I've got any small strength at all it's it's bringing that group sensibility to a freelance situation right. I, in other words the antithesis of right i'm here what do you want me to play right thanks bye you know, well, that kind of, sounds you know, like yeah it sounds like you can adapt to almost any close to i mean many different genres of music and, and feel comfortable doing it then yeah i ish there's yeah. there's some areas that you know if I in the rare occasions I get called if, if somebody called me to do some serious jazz fusion thing which I'm not a fan of anyway that kind right. of music like and bitches other, brew maybe yeah well I mean you know having said that I was a huge weather report fan yeah but 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 aside from that you know the more kind of jazzy fusiony this one's in 13 over 17 and then we go to the section where he's come up with a riff and I play this cross rhythm and all that kind of stuff I'm more of a song guy so yeah. on the rare occasions when I've been offered those kind of things I say you know you really should call Joe Joe Schmo because he'd make a much better job of that kind of music than I would because he's right. going to understand he or she's going to understand it and play it better gotcha. but, but, but but you know from no, it was, it was actually, it's funny you talk about the wide variety. Uh, in 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 the UK, generally speaking, I'm still the folk drummer. <laughs> you know, and right. It, it, and it's one of the things that one of the many reasons I came to the states because it was almost like starting over. You know, right. There, there wasn't. Oh, you're the folk guy. You know. Right. Well, I mean, when you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Wikipedia, but when you look up Fairport on Wikipedia, it's British folk rock. You know, mm -hmm. so it's exact. It's you know, you unfortunately you get that tag, and, oh, and yeah. it's hard to and it's hard to you know like different actors. You know, in a way, you know, an actor mm -hmm. like Jack Nicholson. I mean, when they're you're hi you're hiring to for Jack, you know, yeah. or that persona or a Cary Grant. You know, so it's it's exactly. it's hard to really lose that kind of the persona or or that you know the tag. i yeah, agree the tag I agree. Yeah. the tag yeah i agree yeah. and i i think i've noticed with actors that i admire if if the ones some of the you know the, the i mean there's so many but if they start to go down a path and they 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 the ones that are more concerned about the bigger picture they do a real left turn like mm. um if i was just talking to my wife about this last night Ben Kingsley definitely got the the reputation as that kind of you know semi I, through Gandhi and some other films got that kind of soft kind of reputation right. and I don't know if, if you've ever seen a film called Sexy Beast. Oh yeah, well familiar with Sexy Beast. I love yeah. it. Well, love I, that I, mean, I was saying I, I wouldn't have been at all surprised if if that got offered to Kingsley and he went, "This is so left of center. I'm I'm going to go." I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and I've occasionally done this, the, you know, the same things. I mean, like getting to work with, you know, the XDCs and the Brian yeah. Eno's and, and, you know, things that, that, and obviously, although it was, it was folky in some ways, but Tull. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that helped. But over here, I didn't get the folky thing quite so much. It was, it was either, oh, you've worked with, or yeah. it right. would be, or it would be, what did you say your name was again? Right. And I was perfectly happy with that. I had no illusions about don't you know who i am or right any of that shit or, you know yeah i, I, I think it's wanted to work yeah it's really weird over here sometimes because it's more or less who you played with you know in a way rather than you know what you've what you've done sometimes uh -huh. I, I feel here in the states and which i think yeah. is, is is a shame 
you know. I think that it, it, I think that's very accurate. Yeah, mm -hmm. some people manage to get around it, and other people get kind of stamped with it. Yeah. Right. Right. Gotcha. So let's let's talk. Let's let's get into the the Beatle world here. Uh, oh, yes. George Harrison. Um, you know he he's working on his somewhere um uh, somewhere in England album that it gets uh, rejected, and now he's doing these four new songs, and then that's when I first see your name pop up. Is these you know, these sessions for, for these uh, songs, I believe it's Blood From A Clone, Teardrops, and uh, That Which I Have Lost. Um, well, before we get to that, you know, talk about, you know, getting, being introduced to George and how did that, 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 that come to be? Um, that came through my friend, the wonderful percussionist, Ray Cooper. Ray Cooper. Right. Who I, we've known, we've known each other for a long time. Mm -hmm. And he called me and he said, um, George has heard some of the you know work you've done, and, and I think you, you guys would be a good fit. And my actual first session with with George, as you probably know this, was the day after John got shot, mm. and he and he called me back and said, "Have you heard what's happened?" And I yeah. I didn't know about it then, mm. and he said, "I don't think we're going to record." I said, "All right, well that's mm. awful, whatever." And then he called me back and said that George thinks that. That it would be better for him to make music than to sit around thinking about it. So yeah. we're on, um, and and that that was the first session. And I can't I can't recall the timeline, but I know there was that thing, the end theme music for yeah the, the time was, bandits the time bandits dream yeah dream away dream away dream away yeah that yeah. was that was it was that one and blood from a clone and I can't remember did you say there was some other Tear, teardrops does that yeah. ring a bell and then that which i have lost neither of those ring a bell I, are you okay. sure that's me on on those i that's why i'm asking i'd have to hear them to, yeah. to know whether it was me yeah. or not those okay. are the only two that i remember right. i mean there might have been more but i i cannot recall and then blood from a clone <laughs> is is probably my favorite song you know, on that album, even more so than, you know, all those years ago is the hit, you know, but Blood, but Blood From A Cone is so, so strange and unique sounding. Um, I mean, what do you remember from that? I mean, were you like given uh, instructions or you, were you free to play what you wanted for that song? The way I played on that, I, I, I like the ideas. My execution leaves something to be desired. I'm, mm. I'm not crazy about me on it. It is what it is. It was me kind of trying to do a little bit of my hero Jim Keltner trying to think of what yeah. would Jim do but it was more that the weirdness of the drum part if it is weird at all was more a response to to the lyrical content mm -hmm. what he was saying he, right. he, was, he was just fed up with all that techno drum machine shit right. and I remember thinking I'm going to play something my, my kind of mindset was yeah program this right which now, is one, it's it's not straight it's kind of all over the place so like okay. i said the execution my execution is it's okay it's not right. that great but but i'm happy that and i he did he george did he i think he raised a little bit of an eyebrow because it was so left of center right and and then uh, and then ray said no i i, I think we can make this work so and, and bless him he did yeah. So did you hear a demo of the song first and then you, nope. okay. So it's just, you know, here's the song and let's do it. Yep. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here's, here's, here's the song. What do you think? And I, right. I said, well, that's, that's a great song. And he just programmed a straightforward drum mm. machine to it. And, and I overdubbed the drums, but, but a, I was probably, I think that was the first time I met him mm. and he, was so nice and cool. so friendly right and was did, did it feel any did you sense any sorrow from him over what, yeah, what, what was, happened we the thing that i remember we was we sat around afterwards uh, and i think it was um him uh ray olivia myself it might have been someone else it was a very young danny i think mm -hmm. hovering around somewhere and and we got talking about the point where the fan changes from being a fan of one's music to getting 
you know, getting a little bit, uh oh, what's going on here? And Ray Cooper was talking about sometimes he'd look out into the audiences on EJ gigs and he'd see a whole bunch of people with rimmed glasses and waistcoats and collarless mm. shirts and think, uh oh, you know, this is, they're getting this too far. And and then we obviously we got talking about about right. the, John and the, the the whack job that had killed John, yeah. and and how things had gone out of control for some people. And George's great statement it, that made me realise just the extent to which they really were four guys who grew up together. Right. George said, George said, and I'll never forget this. And I've been quoted recounting this story before George said I just wanted to be in a band mm. and and it was that moment that all the Beatle craziness just evaporated away and you you realized yeah it's just a, a really good guitar player mm -hmm. that wanted to be in a band like most of us like me I mean I I I I I wasn't so much band, but I knew I wanted to be a mu musician, not as a career, right. but just I just wanted to play music. Right. And, and and at that point, with the, hearing George say that, it's like, yeah, all, all that stuff happened to them. And God bless them, they managed to just about hang on to their sanity. Right. But at the end of the day, it was four guys who went through the most incredible Thing. Oh, the journey they went through uh, is incredible yeah. yeah and i think that and it helped me understand that they kept each other from going completely batshit mm. if, if any one of them would kind of you know start to slide the the other three would, would right would pull them back. i mean you know i don't know i i'm right. I, yeah, it's all speculation, really. But it feels like, yeah. Right. It yeah. feels like yeah. it, it's it's it seems like it I mean everything changed once what well, that unfortunate day happened because you mm -hmm. see a lot of times, especially in the in the 70s, just musicians, actors just out and about in the crowds doing this, and then all of a sudden Lennon's the passing happens, and then it's just like it seems like all that just ends you know people are more cautious now you know we we've got an entourage we've we've got bodyguards you know yeah so. yeah well i went i it was wasn't too long after that that i went to montserrat with paul right we're going to dig uh, into that in a second yeah yeah and 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 they even out there they up the security mm. i remember his people saying no we've got extra people because you just right. don't know what's out there right yeah, you, you're right yeah. Right. So, um, so is Dream Away and, and Blood from a Clone pretty much at the same time, or do you remember which one was I think, first? I, I, on, <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, believe it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, certainly, yeah. certainly close together. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So then now let's let's move into Paul. I mean, uh, how does how does one get a phone call from Paul or George Martin, or how I mean, how does that happen? Beats me. <laughs> I don't, I have no idea. I have no idea. I I bumped into him in a music shop in Denmark Street. He was oh. there with Linda. Yeah, okay. right. there with Linda in a music shop that I used to go to, and I kind of embarrassed myself because I was so taken aback. I think I said something inappropriate. I can't remember, but I remember thinking afterwards, "Oh, you you twit, Maddox, you you've blown it there," and then. And then there was like, I think I'd already done a session with George Martin. Okay. Um, with Jeff Engineering. Okay, right. Um, Emmerich, yeah. I think it was for a Silla Black record. Okay. I think, I think I'm on a, a couple of tracks on a Silla Black. So I think they'd already worked with me. And I, I guess <laughs> I, I'm laughing because. I've told this story to some in some in some drum circles, but um, I had kind of like a jazz kit. I really, this is one of the things I remember about the Silla Black sessions. I had kind of like a jazz kit, and I had a small bass drum. Mm. And if you know anything about recording, typically nine times out of ten, you either have a hole in the head or you or, or you you take the front head off. Mm. You don't have two resonant holes. That that's a kickback to kind of big band. Right. And although it can be done, it's possible. To, it's perfectly possible. 
to record a, a bass drum that way. But anyway, so I had this small jazz drum mm. and I was so full of piss and vinegar on this session with Scylla um, that I remember <laughs> Jeff saying, um, could you take the front head off the bass drum? Mm. I remember going, no. <laughs> I was so full of myself back then. I mean, I, I'm mortified. I mean, I am surprised when I think about that, that they did call call me subsequently, but right. and, 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 and that Jeff or George said, don't ask him, he's a terrible asshole. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was the first session, I think, with George and Jeff. Mm. That was at Air Studios. And right. then bumped into Paul at that music shop. And then I... I've got my timeline isn't so good. It must have been maybe six months or a year after that. Mm. I got a call and I can't remember which was the first session. Well, um, well, before I'm we get sure. to that, um, yeah, so I'm sorry, man. No, 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 it's all right. No, um, did you, did you follow his solo career at all? Well, of course. Okay, were you oh, a fan oh. of his music? Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's Paul McCartney. <laughs> So now my uh, my research shows, and hopefully you can. I mean, I don't know how, how much. Obviously, it's a long time. You, you've done a lot of stuff, and yeah. and and memories come and go. But uh, what I'm showing is, is you know, you you're there at Monstrat for a week, starting right. in January 28th. Okay. Okay. And what you've played on then during that week would have been a song. Songs called "Average Person." Dress Me Up as a Robber, The Pound and Sinking, and Hear Me Lover, which those two songs ended up becoming one. I don't, uh, the first two, you're right. I'm not sure what the one, is it Me on Pound is Sinking? I can't remember. No, not the finished product, not the oh. finished product. But what I'm saying is these these four, these four songs then in my research say that you 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 did demos for, or you guys just played around with those those four songs. I, I definitely remember cutting Dress Me Up. And okay. what was the other one? Average Person? Yes, I definitely, that's me okay. on that one, yeah. Because yeah. then I think that one ends up uh, being Ringo as credit, credited to Ringo then. So they must have worked on that one then after after you left. So being there a week, was that what they offered you or was that all the time that you had? Do you recall? Well, I that's what I got offered. Uh, and they they went out there and then when i saw who was coming in mm -hmm. stanley clark ringo gad gad and everything i said initially i said <clears throat> would you mind if i hung around mm -hmm. and they were very very accommodating and said yeah in fact there's a side thing there george martin i think again my timeline's not sh not clear i either subsequently worked with george martin on Gary Brooker's first solo album. I can't remember whether that came before or after. Anyway, George obviously took to me because he said to me out in Montserrat, Dave, don't stay with the other hooligans in this ensemble. Why don't you come and stay with me and Judy in the house? <laughs> so I got to stay with George and wow. Judy out in wow. their house in Montserrat. Oh. I remember getting friggin' served breakfast by Judy Martin the first, and I'm going, this is not real. I am here <laughs> recording with Pinch this me. guy, and I've got George Martin's wife asking me if I want coffee or, I mean, this is just, this is surreal. Anyway. Uh, what were your first impressions what, of Montserrat? Oh God, it was beautiful. I loved it. I loved it. The, the, I loved the place. I mean, I'd spent time in the Caribbean. My wife and I um, uh, uh, used to go out there for holidays, um, but I, I, I loved it. And the studio was unbelievable. I mean, I'd spent a lot of time uh, at that time in air studios in London. So I, I, I was familiar with right. high-end studios, mm -hmm. but Montserrat was just something else. That's, that's one of the great tragedies. I mean, I know George and yeah uh, and jeff lost so much money on that when yeah it, that it documentary on that 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 documentary on george martin where they they show the yes. studio after yes. the after fact of it and oh, oh, man. heartbreaking Absolutely. heartbreaking yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so, so I, yeah but, so i was i was there for that first week saw who was coming in initially said could i stay they said yes and then i realized 
that I had a session backed with booked back in London mm. with Gus Dudgeon. And because yeah. it was Gus, I couldn't I couldn't kind of postpone it. And I knew it was see, I think it was it might have been with I can't remember. Was it um it might have been with Gilbert O'Sullivan. I can't okay. remember. But it right. was an important session. So I remember in the space of kind of 24 hours, I went from Montserrat to pissing down with rain in London at CBS Studios on a Monday morning. And thinking, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what's, what's happened? Right, right. Yeah. So that, that first week then, I mean, uh, do you recall how those sessions went? Um, you know, Paul's notorious for, for knowing what he wants, but he also sometimes will give freedom to musicians to play, you know, and add their, you know, their bits to it as he, well. He, I would start playing something and he'd go, yeah, when you get to that bit, maybe more kind of thing. I've said something like this. Yeah, right. that was as much as he told me. Gotcha. I don't remember him ever kind of, you know, mm -hmm. nailing things down that the way we talked earlier about, I want this, 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 this. And when it gets to this bit, do this, this, this. He, he, he pretty much gave me free reign. I mean, if he, obviously, if he heard something that he, that he didn't think fitted, with with his with his larger plan than he'd right. say but it was never it was always delivered in the, in a fantastic way and it was never oppressive and it was always very much a case of collaboration cool nice you know which is, right. which is which is why i love working for him you right. know in other words it's we're back to that thing about whichever side of the glass you are, are on having a certain amount of trust musical as well as liking the person you have a certain amount of musical trust in the per, in the person and you 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 let them get on with it because that's when they if they feel that they are there because of what they bring to the table forgive the cliche right. then you're going to get a great you're going to get something really terrific out of them as opposed to oh no because i've been i've seen the other side of it you know i've seen the other side of it don't do that. No, no, no. What the f are you doing there? Don't do that. <laughs> right. oh, check this, check that. Oh, who told you to? That's not what I, and, and the, the atmosphere just goes, you know, it just goes through the floor. Wow. So it, 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 I've, I've seen so, and it's helped me when I've, you know, when I produce things now, mm. because, you know, you, you, you're maybe one isn't as conscious of this stuff in one's earlier on in one's life and as you get right. a little bit further you you realize you realize the the positive as attributes that, that that lead to successful conclusions gotcha okay fair enough um so then now starting with tug of war you you perform the next three albums you're you're credited on one track per album so you got uh, dress me up as a robber on tug of war which you got the wonderful poster behind you which uh, you know kicks ass <laughs> i love it um and then uh pipes of peace you you've you've got the song through our love the ballad you recall anything from that song oh wow look at that can you that's amazing can and that's all it? yeah it's autographed uh uh album cover of uh, pipes of peace today love love and tar that's awesome yeah um, in um, I, yeah, that was uh, some so of the stuff the following was, year eighty three, because yeah. that because he recorded like an album and a half's worth of material, so so half of what he re that didn't make it on Tug of War ended up on Pipes of Peace, and then there uh -huh. was another four or five songs recorded for Pipes of Peace with yes. Squire Love, uh, being one of those songs. Do you mm -hmm. do you remember the, the the sessions for that song? Not my main recollections. Um, Cause that would have been at back at Air Studio then. Yes, yeah. The the stuff that I I did with him was was Montserrat mm -hmm. and Air, and then there was some sessions with myself and Dave. Yeah, we'll, and yeah, we'll get to that too in a second. Because, yeah. 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 So yeah. so yeah, the, the 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 pipes of peace must have been cut at air 
Okay. Um, oh, and then there's also some stuff at Abbey Road as well. But yeah, right. that, that was done at Air. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. And then then Broad Street. Then you get uh, you're you're playing on a, a Beatles classic. Um, how did you feel about that long and winding road? Um, I can tell you about that. Yeah, I would love to hear about that because then you know this is a song where Paul never really cared for he, well, he, he criticized phil Spector's work on it on the uh, on the let it be uh album and now here he is changing it up uh adding saxophone to it and then you know here you are playing drums on it so let's talk about that there was something i think possibly i'm not sure about this i because I, I never like to be too nosy but i think there was some publishing issue or legal or something where they couldn't use the original track okay and i think he discussed it with george martin and they decided to recut it and originally they put the original track up mm. and said could you play alongside this and when we listened to it um I, I feel I feel I'm going into sacrilegious territory here, but the tempo really kind of yeah, I mean you don't realize it when you when you when you listen to it because it feels great, but trying to play along to it, it 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 wasn't really gonna work. Let's just mm. leave it at that. Um so the decision was made to recut it. Mm -hmm. Um and I remember saying, Do you want me to do my best to copy the drum fills and everything. And it was like, no, do just do your own thing. Oh, wow. oh cool. So let's do your own thing. And what I do remember is we cut it without a click. And the first take, George said, George Martin said, it needs to be two seconds longer because it goes into a a thing on the film that I need to match up with a blah, blah, blah. Uh, Gotcha. Okay. And I said, yeah, that's right. It needs to be two seconds longer. So can you can we get another take? And can you lean back a, a bit on it? Mm. And I said, yeah, okay. And I counted it in, and it came in two seconds longer. Wow, excellent, excellent. So I mean, so you I'm did... very proud about that. So and this that was, was live vocal, I believe. Gotcha. So then this was was this recorded before or after the filming of of Broad Street? Do you recall? During, I think. During, okay. During. I think. Okay. I think. Right. I, I maybe. The I, I'm guessing the back end because I know George was work. George Martin was working to film. Right. So I'm thinking the back end. Maybe the okay. bulk of the filming have been done. Mm hmm. Okay. I think. Okay. No, great. Whatever. Anything you can remember about it is is great. <laughs> I remember, I remember it was great because I can't remember who played electric piano. He did a fantastic job, but Paul was on acoustic um, and sang it. <clears throat> the great Herbie Flowers right. on, on bass. bass right. And, um, and uh, Dick Morrissey, great tenor. And I remember George coming out and saying to Dick, no, it's more like a kind of blah, blah vibe. Mm. And Dick going, oh, okay, you mean like this? He said, yeah. Okay. And, we we had it down in well well that's I think it was I think there was a first take and then the second take and the second take was the one that George Martin said we need to have this two seconds longer to fit the film because we weren't running we weren't running to click mm. and the third it must have been the third take was it gotcha did did you, did you get nervous at all playing such a classic song and kind of like you feel like the spotlight's on you to make sure you get it right because the song is so so iconic and you know no. i'm working here with paul mccartney and george park <laughs> no um cool. and that's not any sense of grandeur but it's also i mean you know trust me <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm. I'm aware. I mean, I've got a great anecdote for you for you later when we talk when we get to um, yeah. Run Devil Run. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, I'm more than aware of my situation. But at that stage, I'd kind of got a reasonable handle about putting that aspect to one side. Because mm -hmm. if you don't put it to one side, you'll you'll be a gibbering lunatic. Right. Because you know you go. 
oh god yeah i got yeah, go to the same room with all of them you know you, right. you've got and plus those people are so great at creating an atmosphere that makes you feel comfortable cool, cool. they're the you know paul and george Harrison and George Martin and all the best people that I've been fortunate enough to work with. They're very good. Because I think, especially, obviously, George and Paul, incredibly aware of the fact that, I mean, how can you not go, oh, look at Alice, right. you know, and they're very good at making people feel at ease. And Maybe it's that's an easier, a slightly easier thing to do in a more intimate situation. Mm. You know, like I, I, Karen, my wife and I got invited to a couple of Paul's Christmas parties, and you know, on the way there, you kind of, you know, you're a gibbering lunatic. There could be anybody, <laughs> you know, there could be anybody in the world here, and then right. you get, and then you get inside, and think, how's it going? And Linda right. and Linda and my wife ended up talking about horses for half an hour and stuff. Right. And you you realise that that they're just really super people right. who've had this extraordinary thing happen to them. But when you're in that situation, I found in in the studio, they they were they were just great, and and Ooh. there was never any kind of. Uh, yeah. I mean, you they're they're obviously in charge, but there right. was never. You, they just, like I said, just to reiterate, they always created a great atmosphere, and we were just so cool interacting with all the musicians that you you never you you didn't feel intimidated or, mm -hmm. or ill at ease. Right. The, the one of the sessions that I was really looking forward to talking to you about uh, was these David Foster sessions because you know he's got this career of being you know. He even likes to call himself an asshole or a prick or whatever, especially on his documentary that it just came out on Netflix, you know, and, um, and he's now, I mean, he's just becoming this, this mega producer after having these hits now with Chicago. I mean, he's having, well, I think he had a couple number one hits with them and um, coming in to, to this work with, um, with uh, David Foster, it's you, it's Gilmore and McCartney and oh my God, what a trio that that was i mean that i mean the, those sessions i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for those sessions because it's that lineup is is is, is amazing and my first question is do, do you recall because i can't find any information where these ses where the session took place do you recall where where were you guys recorded the tracks the track that i ended up was right. cut up called sussex place okay sussex so place. hog hill yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. Okay. um I think, if memory serves correctly, I ran into a Paul about a year or a couple of years after those sessions mm -hmm. and said what happened. And it, he said words to the effect, oh, it just didn't kind of work out with David. Right. Um, and I then got a call from the engineer who mixed that, who later went on to produce uh um, what's it called uh run devil run or okay that... chris thomas no 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 not no it's not chris thomas oh, no, oh, okay. wrong end of the stick there. oh he produced uh, yeah he was an engineer producer i don't think i worked with chris I, if i did i can't recall um anyway he called me up and he said i really like what you did would you come and do some sessions for me and i said yes and i never heard from him again so mm. i don't know what happened about that but the, i do recall and that was, yeah, that was down at Paul's place in Sussex, which I'd not been to. And unsurprisingly, that was, he. I think he'd almost done, a, if, if, again, if memory serves, uh, um, if not the room in terms of the gear, uh -huh. it, was, it was like Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah, this would have been, well, if that's the Abbey Road, then that would have been MP, his MPL office, which has the replica down in the basement of Abbey Road. I I have never recorded at M downstairs at MPL. Okay. Ab Abbey Road number two is huge. huge. Okay. It's huge, and I don't think when I say he the Sussex studio reproduced it, I think it reproduced it in terms of 
a lot of the outdoor okay. gear and a lot of the mic. Uh, the room, gotcha. the room wasn't this. The room wasn't okay. certainly wasn't the gotcha. same. It was a great room and a great sounding room. But I know, I think Jeff Emmerich, um, mm. again, had, had a big hand in in equipping that particular right. studio. Right. But I recall those sessions um, very well. I think I only did. I could be wrong. I think I only did a couple of days. Yeah. The, the songs I'm seeing that, that you worked on would have been um, I Love This House, mm -hmm. uh, We Got Married, which you are credited on for Flowers in the Dirt, yep. and then a, a, a track that has yet to been released called Lindiana. Okay. You know, so... Um, I'll take your word on the others. The, the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, one I know, the one I do know about was, was, was We Got Married. We Got Married, I, okay. I came up with a little thing at the end. <clears throat> Mm. Um, on the turnaround that 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 both Paul and the and the uh, producer liked gotcha. the on the symbol, but I recall those sessions very well and 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 got on also got on very well with Dave too. Oh, did you? Okay, cool. Yeah, very well with Dave. And I, in fact, I saw him just last in September because mm. I played at the Albert Hall at um, Richard Thompson's seventieth birthday party, mm. and Dave Gilmore was one of the guests. And I haven't okay. seen him since those sessions. Uh, well, since the, the Wonder 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 Wonder. Wonder. yeah 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 so yeah. it's great to see him again and he was super friendly but no i mean you know once again you know it's like pinch me <laughs> right you know, I, I, david I, foster friggin paul yeah. and right and this, and this bloke called dave gilmore is playing the guitar <laughs> uh, you know in those situations man you know i'm fond of saying this uh, you know you got to be pretty friggin stupid to screw something like that up mm. if you're playing with people of that caliber right you, you know you got to be pretty hopeless to because right. they they just raise your your bar so right much. right mm -hmm. i'm a I'm, I'm a chef and i worked at a, a catering company where we did a lot of concerts so uh -huh. i would you know here in arizona las vegas and we used to uh do shows at the hollywood bowl uh -huh. um so we had the uh, they gave a gilmore i think this was 2016 or 17 and mm -hmm. um he did he had four shows so it was a week-long gig and three days were all rehearsals and i you know i'm there cooking and just listening to this guy rehearse and it's just it was just really mind-blowing just to hear you know hear him play you know he's playing these you know these deep pink floyd cuts that he ended up not doing during the show wow and yeah oh just just amazing just what a treat uh yeah. that was but um yeah. oh, really amazing that must have been that must have been did you get it i don't suppose you got a chance to have a chat i was him. no but i mean i was face to face with him during yeah. during one lunch and you know your nerves sometimes get the best of you <laughs> and sometimes Wonderful. when that happens it's just best <laughs> to keep your mouth shut <laughs> yeah. yeah you got that you got that right you got that right but if you had a if, you know with guys like that, I've found in the past, you just say something pretty straightforward yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, thanks for the, they'll probably come back with something. Yes. Yeah. There's just a few, and you probably know who they are as well as I do, mm -hmm. that you just don't want to have any interaction with. Right. And one of those but, persons was yeah. Ian Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Well, I, you don't have to, but, but let's, let's, I mean, after, you know, you, you did some work with Paul. Um, my wife is a huge Jethro Tull fan. And um, I noticed you did work on, uh, you did tour with him during, uh, during well, this, uh, this, yeah, yeah. Little, uh, yeah. little, little light music. Um, yeah. I, so, did, I did a whole year with, 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 with JT. Yeah. yeah. So again, now you're like, like Fairport, you're, you're coming into a, an established band and now you have to learn all these songs, uh, uh -huh. pretty much just for tour. I mean, you're, you're considered a hired gun for, I would imagine then for the, just for this tour and, uh, -huh. uh talk about that situation. Well, the, the connection there was Dave Pegg. Dave Pegg is a Fairport bass player and Dave okay. Pegg. At that point, I joined Jethro Tull and was a fully paid up member. Right. And what happened was Ian was starting to come and see more Fairport gigs. So he kind of was getting the feel of the band and and liked part of it. Right. So I get a phone call from Peg and said, Ian's going to ask you to do a tour and some recording. Mm. And so I took a deep breath and said, OK. And then I met with Ian and we started talking and I said, I have to tell you, I'm flattered that you've asked, 
but I can't do that thing that all your other drummers do with the two bass drums and the oh fills, double bass, the double bass and the yeah. fills at a million miles an hour and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. I I don't do that, and I I I it's not my thing. So you know, I'm telling you that up front. And he went, well, I know that, but I want you to bring your thing to this band. Yeah, because it's a definitely and, definitely a different sounding Jethro Tull on this live. On the yeah. album. Yeah, it is. It is different. Uh, and, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit in a minute. Okay. Um, he, I got a lot of input from drummers and other musicians. And it was along before I started working with him. Uh, and, and it was along the lines of he, he eats drummers alive. He's going to be all over you like a rash. He's going to be telling you this, telling you that. And I, and I which made me even more nervous mm. and in all the time the whole year that i worked with him i think he only once said to me i missed a cue a visual cue we were on the back end of a gig and i missed a visual cue and 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 missed an ending or something and he said mm. you must you must watch me when i do this it means that and i said that's my fault i'm sorry i missed it that was the only thing he said to me in, in a whole year wow so the whole thing about you know, oh, each drum is alive and he does this and everything. And the reason that record sounds a little different is because it was just the four piece. Mm. And uh, the only thing that I had was a bass drum, a snare drum, one cymbal and, wow. a, and a pair of hi-hat cymbals. Wow. And I had, I had a synthesizer a three octave synthesizer on one side of me that I was playing some of the string parts with and on my left or maybe the other way around I can't remember was a glockenspiel for playing some figures okay but it was it's literally snare bass snare drum bass drum hi-hat and one cymbal mm. but hopefully it doesn't sound empty but it does sound different from and there's no right. key obviously there's no keyboard right so that's why it, it it sounds different but i i'm proud of that record yeah and no I, I i like it so i, but I, I enjoyed my year i had right. a good time so. right so what then you, you put this album up did you have to i know there's some um world-renowned live albums out there that end up needing some studio work afterwards you mm -hmm. know like you know, Kiss, even McCartney, you know, mm -hmm. Wings Over America. I mean, did you guys have to do any of that for this album? The only thing I think, when I listened to it, the only thing I think that happened is I think Ian overdubbed a tambourine in a couple of places. Mm. Gotcha. I think that's the only overdubs. There was no replacing. And and the concerts were, as you see them on the credits, mm -hmm. we did this fantastic European tour. Yeah, with, yeah. Munich, you know, all over the place, and uh, uh, all yeah, over Greece, the London, Germany, Switzerland, Israel. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, you're all over the place. Yeah, yeah, and there was, I think, he picked, he'd listen back either the following day or the day after and make notes, and I think he picked what he felt was the best song from each of those nights, yeah. and then there was a break, and then we went to America and did kind of part two but that's when i went to a full kit and we got andy giddings in mm. on calls. gotcha gotcha um a question regarding sessions and 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 touring you don't have to get too descriptive with the answer here but what's better pay touring or or sessions back then it was sessions okay yeah okay back then it was sessions but 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 these days it's almost flipped yeah, because the, the, the recording industry is basically on its knees because there's an entire generation that's come that has, has come up that either consciously or subconsciously thinks music should be free. Mm -hmm. so, so the recording industry, certainly for my world, right. is, is, is I wouldn't say it's non-existent, but it's it certainly is is a is less than a shadow of its former self. Right. The only thing that is keeping a lot of my peers going. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's different if you are Paul and and, and right. you're up, you're up in that stratosphere. Level, yeah. But, yeah. but everybody else needs to tour, mm -hmm. which is why COVID has been even devastating, more, ever even more devastating because yeah. the the one the one avenue left 
for most musicians to earn money has been yeah. taken away from them. So, but but you know, we everyone's in the same boat. So it's yeah, not like yeah. I'm having yeah, I, having, I'm not crying on behalf of musicians. Right. I'm just saying that's the reality. Yeah. No, yeah, no. Having seen that 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 side of 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 the production side of it, because you know, as a chef, you know, I, I'm in there, you know, you know, feeding the crew and and band members and stuff like that. You see all the work that goes into you know putting the stages together, the you know the audio, the technician. I mean, all that work, the the drivers, you know, um, you know, semi drivers, you know, bus driver. I mean, all, there's a lot of people that are now affected for this, and it's just. It's a shame, really. It's is. a whole. It's a whole. It's a whole thing. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, people just who don't know, and there's no reason why they should or think about it. But as right. you as you correctly point out, the the the, the, the focus is the musicians, and you realise there's this entire subgenre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I pertinent to that. My and again, it took me a while to realise just how big those things, those tours were, and they still are at that level was my friend, the guitarist, Tim Rennick, who I did a lot of work with over the years. Tim toured with Floyd for quite some time. And I went to see a Floyd gig. He got me in to see a Floyd gig. I think it was back end of the seventies. Mm. And I said, how long is this tour going on? He said, it's, I said, it's going to be over a year. Wow. Said, wow. And he said, yeah, and we probably ain't going to go into the black until about halfway through. Amazing. I mean, it costs that much money to put it's those insane. shows together. Yeah. It's insane, yeah. Yeah, and I know Paul's shows are, are like that. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the cost of, as you say, you just see, you know, people walk into a, the, the place and they see four or five musicians on stage and they, and there's no reason why they should, but the, the right. entire subculture that, that makes that happen is, right. is, is and, amazing. Yeah, because it's amazing that, you know, you hear, hear okay, he's going to make, let's, let's say, for example, he's making a million dollars a show, people I go know. crazy about it, but you don't realize that that million dollars is going to the backing band, it's going to the production team, it's, it's going to the drivers, I mean, it, it's going to catering, I mean, it's just going to, in so many, and going to, to rent for the for stadium or this, or the arena where he's playing, you know, yeah. so. You're, you're so right, you're, and you, you and you and I are obviously in the minority about yeah. that, people, people go, oh, He's getting a minute poor. No wonder he's so. Uh, right. Yeah, sure. By the time you know you've hired the the venue itself, by the right. time you know the, the manager and the agent, right, and the crew and the blah and the blah and the blah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It all adds up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I I, would, I I got some illuminating. I'm not going to go into them, but I got some illuminating figures. Even just and, and she was she wasn't up in but Paul Macker. Mm -hmm. territory but just recording just working and recording not only with jt mm -hmm. but also with mary chapin carpet oh yeah mm -hmm. same kind of thing you know the the the, the per cost gig right it costs to put one gig on i got told the video i went really <laughs> right yeah. yeah but if you divide everything up and up. that's what it costs to put one gig and i went whoa yeah. <laughs> By the time every, as you say, the bus drivers, the crew, the caterer, yeah. the venue, the agent, the blah, the blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, it's, it's, anyway. Were you, asked, were, you, were you ever asked to tour with uh, Paul? Were you ever asked to be, because he had that touring band then, so, so come 89, you know, he starts touring again, uh, but you're recording with him up until like the mid 80s. Was there ever talk about you joining him uh, well, to be well, part of a band or, or anything like that, do you recall? He did make some offers about doing some unusual recording situations, tributes to this, tributes to that. Mm. And there was two or three times when I had to turn him down mm. incredibly reluctantly because of commitments to Fairport. Right. And I remember thinking if I hadn't have turned him down, I wonder if he may have asked. I don't I don't know. He did he literally offer me a touring job? No, he didn't. Yeah. But I did have to turn him down incredibly reluctant. There was one situation and I remember his his guy Alan Crowder saying, Look, we'll if you finish it, blah blah blah, we'll get you a cop to, to fly you from blah, oh, wow. to, one of those kind of deals. Right. And I said, 
I said, Anna, it's fantastic, but that means I'm not going to be able to make, yeah, but is there any way? And I said, I really, I can't let the guys down. That has to be a good feeling, though. Well, it's... <laughs> so, I mean, to be, to be, you know, to be desired, you know what oh, I mean? I was incredibly flattered, but it is truly a, um, yeah, I mean, you've, what a wrench, you know, <laughs> you know. But, right. but, but at the same time, you know, the one thing I've realized is you can't, you can't do the what if, but I right. mean, I, I got offered I, somebody else I would have loved to have worked with. I got asked to do a pretender session. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, God, Chrissy. I would have loved to have done it work with Chrissy and I couldn't do it because of commitments. And I'm thinking because one of the things that I learned not to do early days is is blow people off for the uh, potentially bigger name or bigger money because mm. then you just get a reputation for being either a combination of of, of, of either unreliable or a breadhead okay. and, and i and i and i always i've i've tried to stick to that the only time well, i think i broke that rule was when and i won't mention the names i got booked to do a tour and I turned some work down and then that tour got moved. It got moved back like two months or something. And I had to, and they called me and they said, well, are you doing it? I said, no, I can't do it because you've moved the dates. But you said that blah, blah. I said, yeah, that was then. But this has come up in the meantime, since you moved the dates, you didn't tell me when the new dates were. Right. So that's just a, that's just a, a little, <laughs> Don't want to be. A, <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> but that's the kind. Of, anyway, the thing was, yeah, I, 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 I've always tried to stick to that. Otherwise, as I say, it was awful to to turn him down. But I thought, no, I'm not. I can't do it. I can't, otherwise, oh yeah, yeah. If you call him, yeah, if something better comes up, he's just going to drop you like a, you know. And I, I didn't want to be that person. Understood. Yeah, understood. <laughs> Um, okay, so then now let's move to the end of the 90s. Now you're you get asked to to join now. Obviously, there's the band now Paul's doing run double run almost kind of like a tribute for Linda. And the main band has already been established. There's already been work done on the album. You know, Ian Pace, I believe, was the drummer uh, for those sessions. But then there's some sessions that take place afterwards. And then he call, he brings you in. So we'll talk about that for a minute. Do you recall how you entered the picture for for those for those re last remaining songs to be recorded? I don't know why, um, but the band was different um it was i think pete was it pete wingfield on the on the tracks that i played on or was it i can't remember who the keyboard player was on the tracks. i think I the played. keyboards player switched as well with the drummer yeah right. yes yeah i know i know pete uh, pete wingfield is either on the ones with um or uh with with ian but I don't know. I don't know why there was a, a desire to change rhythm sections. I mean, I never questioned that thing. It's it's right. it's I, I you know they 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 know what they're doing. Um, and again, um, I, I remember bumping into Dave on the train, and we came up on the train together because we both lived in Sussex. Gilmore. Yeah. So okay. we both came, we both came up on the train together, which was cool for a couple of those sessions. And again, I had a great time doing that. But the anecdote, <laughs> the anecdote, the anecdote from that is, you know, you probably know more as much as I do, and probably more about those sessions. But the mindset that I got was very much that he wanted to, in terms of the work pattern, to semi recreate the first session. In other words, ten to one, two to five, six mm. to nine, that he did on their first the right. first fabs recording session so we wanted to get in there um you know getting a start on the on the start at 10 o'clock here's the song this is how it goes blah 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 we're going to stop at one o'clock we're going to have lunch and we're going to come back at two and blah blah and just try and and he said to me to all of us i d the last thing i want is pouring over stuff mm. i don't want everything to be under a microscope, the way it sometimes can be. 
you know, at, it, at its worst, you know, the, 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 the old cliche of the Eagles recording sessions when they spend two days getting a bass drum sound. Right. You know. So he said, I just, you know, he said, if you've got a, if you've got an idea, his initial remark was, if you've got a good idea, keep it to yourself. But then he said, then he said, no, if you've got a good idea, say it. Right. And if, and if I think it's going to work and the producer's going to, do it, we're going to do it then, and that's it. We're not wow. going to agonize it. And I remember on one of the tracks, I can't remember. Well, said, um, the, the the what I've got here is that you you were there for May May fourth and May fifth, and uh -huh. one day you were you did all shook up, and the other day you did try not to cry, which was one of the original uh, tracks from from the album. Uh huh. Yeah, that's. And that's then right. did some percussion work on uh, Lonesome Town. Maybe it was Lonesome Town. I think yeah. maybe I maybe <clears throat> had a go at that, or maybe and I heard. I can't remember, but I think it was that one. And I think I said. Maybe it was that one. I can't remember which one, but I remember saying to Paul, "How about uh, maracas on the bridge or something like that?" And thinking he'd say, "Yeah, right, let's look at it. Okay, we'll get." He goes, "Right, grab those, grab those <laughs> maracas, stand with me here. We're going to do it right now." And they engineers come running down. They stick a mic up in the middle of Abbey Road, and we're out in maracas. And I'm thinking, <laughs> "Yeah." Another another pinch me moment. Right. But, um, oh yeah, that's okay. So so we're sitting around just after Paul split at one o'clock. And I remember it was Mick Green, the other guitarist, who used to play with a band called Johnny Kidman Pirates, mm -hmm. iconic English band, and I think an old friend of Paul's from kind of back in the day. Right. And Mick we're sitting around, it was Mick and Dave Gilmore and myself, and it was either Garen. Watkins or Pete, I can't forgive me, I can't remember. Yeah. And Mick and Mick Green goes, he goes, Oh, sometimes this is a bit difficult. I went, I said, well, what do you mean? He says, Well, he says, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm playing the guitar, and we're all having a good time, and it's all sounding good. And he says, <laughs> he says, and then suddenly I look up and I have to say to myself, oh, hey, it's Paul McCartney. <laughs> And we all we all cracked up because we knew exactly what he meant, you know. So it looks like it would have been Garrett uh, Watkins. It's Garrett Watkins, yeah, yeah. Who's, a, who's a monster. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Pete did the, the sessions with Garrett. him. Peace, and, right. Uh, yeah, and Garrett yeah. did the, 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 the session. Um, I remember we, one thing I did show Paul was I was using a very big bass drum oh. with uh two heads on it without the hole in the, the mm -hmm. normally company and he said can i have a go on your drums and although he's left-handed he sat down and played and he said oh how do you play the bass drum like that because it's not dead it doesn't go thump it rings okay. and i said oh you have to play off the bass drum that's when you release the beta from the head you don't bury the beta into the bass drum head you mm -hmm. you play you play off the head it's known as the technique and he's showing me that, and, I, and he said, "Oh, that's cool. I'll have to. I'm going to have to work on that." So I get, "Can I have a go on your bass?" He says, "Yeah, go on." So I turn it upside down, and then suddenly I go, "Oh, Jesus! Put that damn thing back!" <laughs> Not only is it left-handed, but it's that yeah. bass. Put it down before something terrible happens. Right, you, you idiot. But <laughs> this man, he's he's just so. He was just so cool. He yeah. was just. You forget that. Well, he's got this reputation of making people feel comfortable, oh, you know, with whether it's musicians crazy. or interviewers yeah. or anybody, you know, fans. I guess. All the all the times I work with him, he had that in spades, even from the very first time. And then, of course, it gets a little bit easier subsequent times. But he had that. It's, he had that in spades. He's he he is he, he's cliche because you know, right? Not everyone says it, but he really is. He's just a really cool guy. Right. The only time I ever saw him down was, you know, that, that period after Linda passed away. He was oh, okay. a long time to come out of. Right, yeah. right. And then um, I'm, I forgot to ask you during the tug of war sessions, because then you you, you joined them like pretty much a month after Lennon was, was murdered yeah. for the most part. And then I would imagine there was things seemed a little down at first, maybe, or did you, do you recall it being a, a, a cheerful session that week? 
I wouldn't say it was cheerful, but it wasn't down in the dumps. I think there's always there was always a spirit of of just trying to make the best music you you, mm. you possibly can, right. and right. not letting not letting things the situation get to you too much. I mean, I'm sure he w w how he reacted to that privately and with Linda is a different a different kettle of fish but right but how he was around the musicians that included myself when we did when you did those sessions i don't recall any negativity gotcha cool so these last you know 20 odd years you've been in the states now uh let's talk about that i mean are you, you obviously you must have been adjusting well and you know living comfortably and you know when you're yeah. still doing your thing these days i mean very much so yeah. yeah yeah i go i go back to england um not this year but i go back to england once a year there's some musicians i i, I tour over there with every spring and the fairports um have a three-day music festival every August. Okay. Um, they've had it takes place over three days, and they've had some really good guests. Emmy Lou and Rodney's done it. Um, Alice Cooper's done it. Oh, cool! So it's 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 a pretty big festival, and they had the fiftieth anniversary a few years ago. So mm. I got invited back as a guest. Great. So I go back and do that, you know, one one once in a while, and it's great to play with everybody obviously they they the guy wonderful drummer who took over from me when i left by the name of jerry conway who's a fantastic drummer he played with cat stevens and mm. he's great so we do the double drama thing and then there's some songs that he does but just with the band and some songs that i do and right and there's guests coming from so that's that's a fun thing to do but the the other band um is is a great fun band that i travel with every spring we make records um the band's called feast of fiddles feast of fiddles um, okay feast 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 of, feast of fiddles okay feast of fiddles yeah and then th that's kind of folk rock i suppose mm -hmm. and then and then here in new england uh pre-covid i've been fairly busy playing with lots of people in the new england area and doing some producing and playing on people's records wow so i, I so the work continues the work continues. Yes, I'm not ready to hang up my sticks just yet. You know. I love to hear that. I love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I, I I I think things you know pre-COVID and uh, things things have been okay for me. I mean, I just I I see myself these days. I, I'm starting to get a handle on how i see myself which is being an accompanist okay i'm not i'm not a technical whiz kid or anything i'm a kind of a meat and potatoes kind of player but but that's that that's what i do and i'm 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 getting a handle on it right well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a great way to describe it. I mean, Ringo describes it that way too. I mean, you, you play to the song in which you, you, you talk about and, and, you know, people like you, are, I mean, I, I think are a treasure to the, to the business. I mean, just making the, the track sound better, not, you know, adding something that's not needed, you know, you get right to the point of the song and, and, you know, it's great. It's great. I love I'm, it. I'm thank you, uh, and and I'm glad you brought up one of my heroes. Mm. Paul did introduce me briefly. We were in Air Studios. I was doing some tracks, and I think Ringo was in there, and I got introduced to him for thirty seconds. And uh. so 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 I've worked with two and met um, um, and met, met Ringo. One. So, yeah. so, uh, yeah. I worked the I worked the sh uh, Ringo show while I was with that camera oh, company. Did? Yeah, so I'm backstage, <clears throat> you know, with the food. Right. And here and he had uh he had Todd Rundgren. Yeah. He had uh, Greg Raleigh. Um yeah. so I got to meet a couple band members and it okay. was really cool. And then so now and uh the Toto guy, Steve Lukather. Um, right. so uh so then in comes Ringo and I'm literally I'm probably no more than ten feet away from him and I'm trying to keep my composure. Yeah. <laughs> 
And, you know, and I'm going, okay, he's going to, he's going to come up to the food any second now. Don't say anything stupid. You know? um, I was about to ask you if you managed to get to, to talk to him for the show. But... Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that I probably would have if, if, because he's, he, he came in, he said he was going to get something to eat. Then he started talking to Steve Lukather and then um, somebody came in the room and said, Barbara was on the phone for him. So then he, then he took off and then obviously Barbara, his wife, and then, um, and then, you know, didn't see him afterwards until the show started, watched the whole show. The show is amazing. You know, yeah. all the, all the, all the musicians that he has are, are great, you know, so top notch. They, they came through Boston a few years ago and I, I went, I went and saw the show. Excellent. Yeah. And his other drummer is. Um, oh, um, uh, ba Bassinet. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Greg's, a, Greg's a great guy. He's a very animated that. drummer. Very animated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I just love when he, you know, is popping up and, you know, making the faces. And, you know. and he just, he's, he, drummers tend to be divided into pro Ringo and, 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 right. The, the stupid ones who think he's the luckiest guy alive. Alive, and right. Let's not, let's, we, we're not going to talk about those, <laughs> but Greg, Greg obviously is, is firmly in the, Ringo and and I I think we've all many drummers who kind of watch watch what's going on out there. Greg's been told some great anecdotes mm -hmm. that he's got from from Ringo over the years right. about working with a band in the in the early days and stuff. Mm -hmm. So now he's a, a real musical hero. I have to say, man, I I, I like everybody. I love that. Um, uh, the, what was the film, the documentary that was done on them? Um, on who? Uh, on the Beatles. Um, oh, the the, the Ron, Beatles anthology. The, the 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 Ron is it the Ron oh, Howard? Ron Howard film. Yes, 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 oh. yes. On the touring, yeah. On the touring. That, that, speak. It, yes, that's it. That one. The, it, I've seen it so many times now. But that <laughs> clip, that clip where I think it's in Washington D, Washington DC, right. playing the box boxing ring and they turn the so drum ten. rides around oh my god when you think about the technology then and where right. we're at now the fact that the four members of the band right. turned the thing and the friggin rises like a jelly mold anyway right. all over wow. the place <laughs> well the when people I... that come on and introduce them and they've got yeah. the beetle masks on and you want to go, oh, my God, <laughs> what those guys went through. It's it's unbelievable. Then when it's when unbelievable. I got to see him live last year, he yeah. performed. We, we have a, a, a smaller venue that has that. It's a rotating stage. So it's a circle yeah. venue and you got the stage in the middle and it rotates. And then through my in my mind throughout the show, I'm going, that would be funny if it breaks down and the band has to get down and, and turn the stage. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Man, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, this what is, the guys went through is, yeah. is unbelievable. God bless them, man. Yeah. Do you keep up with new music? Ish. Ish. Okay. Ish, I do. Yeah. Um, my favorite, um, my favorite English band uh, has been for some down, and, and I suppose they'd be considered old fogies by now because they're all in their 30s. Um, it's called Field Music, F I E L D. Okay. Music. Field music. Yeah. yeah. F I E L D field music. Man, those there's some great, great songs mm. and great I'll singing check it out. Great playing. Yeah. Field music. Cool. Very field good. music. Uh and there's yeah, there's a there's a handful. I I I try to I do maybe listen to a little bit more jazz than than kind of contemporary rock. But yeah, I I I kind of keep my Finger on my finger on on the pulse. I stay away from stuff that you know. I'm not big into rap and right. pop and stuff. I mean, some some of it. Um, Autumn, what's that band? Green Autumn Gr Autumn Green. Mm. That's some good stuff. But generally, so ish. I think is the short answer. That's not fair. 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 Yeah, well, right, yeah, la la yeah. Last question: Coltrane yeah. or Davis? Coltrane or Davis? Coltrane or Davis? Yeah, Miles Davis or Joan Coltrane. Who are you gonna? If you're in the mood to listen to a jazz record, who? What are you gonna pick? That's a bit apples and pears. A little bit. Because the, yeah, because because there's some. 
I'm not too keen on the on the on the at the really out stuff, mm. you know. Um, but both have recorded out stuff and both have recorded beautiful ballads. Right. So it, it it would depend on them. If I, if it was a Saturday night thing, it might be it could be either of them. If it was the Sunday morning thing, it it could be either of them. So gotcha. I'm gonna I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try to gracefully bow out of, of that. understood it's uh, someone it's, uh, a couple of years ago i got, got into a drum thing and someone said moon or bonham oh uh, yeah you know and I, it's i can't i i'm not going to fall down on one side or the other it depends that that is like it's like or, or, apples and oranges man right. it's it's just it's just so different uh, and and it's one step away from that. Who's the best? Blah blah blah. Right. Which my standard, my standard response to that was, was I didn't realize it was a competition. Mm, right. So I think everyone, everyone has got something to offer. Some offer more than others. It depends on what you want. You know. Understood. Great. Sounds like a bit of a bit of a wishy washy sitting on the sitting on the fence answer, but <laughs> there you go. Well, Dave, this was a, a, a magical, magical time for me. Thank you very much for for well, you're being here and, and taking the time out of your out of your schedule for this. And okay, it's it's a dream come true. So thank you. You're more than welcome. I, 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 w give me a send me a link as to when you think this may go out because I'll tell some friends and yeah. And so what will and... so what will happen now since Andy was not be able to be a part of the show we'll record a separate ending where we'll plug everything and uh, we'll add that during post-reduction and then this episode will be up on saturday the 7th and then we oh. i'll i can email you the link um oh. to the show where we do show we do all of our uh we do all of our video cast shows like this on youtube um uh -huh. so um you can find us there or we'll give we'll send you that link Okay, right. and then what will happen is, is Andy will take a, a, a screenshot of the three of us um, mm -hmm. from earlier in the in the interview, and I'll use that to help promote the show as well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So fantastic. again, like I said, we'll, we'll we'll do a little record a little ending bit to it, and then um, he'll do that because Andy's the tech guy. He does all the uh, editing and and stuff right. like that, and. You know, and then um, we'll send it your way, um, and then post it on Saturday. Fantastic! That's great, Tom. I really appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Yeah, Good. thank you. I, I hope you didn't feel this was a waste of your time or anything oh, like no. that. Oh no, very enjoyable. I mean, I'm flattered. You know, really flattered. It's nice when people ask yeah. about stuff that that is 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 cool. I mean, obviously, getting being fortunate enough to work. With those two guys is 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 that's up there for me uh, yeah absolutely you know it's a handful of guys i mean there's you really can't besides the the keltners and the uh the vormans who did a lot of and you know klaus and keltner who did a just a massive amount of work oh, yeah. with those two you you know you really don't see a lot you know maybe like the a couple like the the spinozas the mccrackens the yeah. you know and the gads and the you know um the marattas and you know stuff like a couple people like that who i'm trying to also get on the show as well so you know but um um andy my co-host he's he's going to start doing it working on a um a book about paul during the 80s um, which is, okay. you know, which is a, a, a time where a, um, a time in his life, which is not really talked about and is, and is seen as a kind of like a down period for Paul. And he wants to, you know, so I'm trying to book as many people from the 80s, you know, that I can that worked with Paul, you know, to right. try to get a sense of, you know, Paul as a person, you know, then and, and, and stuff like that. What so what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it was a very productive time. It might not have been his success, most successful period, but it was very productive. You well, know? his 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 output is <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, never, whether, you know, his 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 throw his what some people might consider as throwaway is better right. than most. People. Oh well, yeah. Well, a song like this, uh, "We All Stand Together," is yeah. considered a throwaway. You know, and I think it's brilliant. You know, the 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 uh, he's really he's re-releasing this this month actually for a hundredth anniversary of, of Rupert the Bear. Oh really? Yeah, oh, it's on his website. Cool. Yeah. So. 
Now, do you ever do you get to do any interacting with him? Have you? No, nah, yeah, no. Um, yeah. And I would be too nervous to to find out how. And and <laughs> like I'm like you know for for like you and and, and Lawrence Juber and um, uh, Julian Mendelson, who I've you know who have actually worked with Paul. You know, it's just mm -hmm. you 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 get a little nervous asking people like your like yourself to take time out of your schedule to you know probably answer a question you probably answered you know a hundred times you know thousands of times you know so you know well, that, that's not always the case okay you know, if that if that helps mm -hmm. i mean some of those questions i've heard before some of them i haven't cool cool yeah. i'd like to hear that <laughs> yeah. no there you go man yeah, yeah. good cool. all right all right thank, thank you. you so much i hope andy gets his power back i hope there's nothing serious i hope it's right. a temporary a temporary blip and it's not dave many many thank yous and we'll thank you much i appreciate i appreciate the invite thanks you so much it. you got all right, it man. take it easy okay Bye for now. so what happened you lost power over there <laughs> yeah we had as the song goes a power cut here in new jersey yes. and mm. uh, but i didn't have any candles to burn down low so right. I, I had to go for a little bit but you carried on the interview wonderfully with Mr. Yeah. Maddox, and uh, I really appreciate yeah, it was great. that. And I'm it was... sorry I couldn't be a part of it, but uh, um, great interview and uh, a great guy, um, and great perspectives working with Paul. Yeah, I know he was a, he was really fun to talk with, and and thank you for because I'm you know you're the tech guy, and uh, you help. Thanks for helping me walk through the whole process of everything, and yeah, but um, so yeah, I mean he we pretty much had him on for like two hours but then we had the you know the little mishap but he yeah he was great to talk with and um so anyways great guy to talk with and a lot of fun learned a lot unfortunately you know as we as we've seen in the past when we have you know gentlemen on that are a little older than us their memories aren't as as great as say like a Lawrence Juber's memory you know is but you know but what well, he did anybody I don't think anybody's yeah. quite <laughs> that's right but what he did remember and the stories they did tell were very informative and i appreciate him uh coming on and, and and talking about it. so hopefully you guys out there enjoyed that and you know we'll get more musicians that work with paul in the future and looking forward to talking to anybody that will yeah on. i loved I lo when i was on i loved uh, I, as soon as i knew he was with fairport i had to get yeah. the yes question in because i knew oh, yeah. Yeah. i knew his i knew his he had, had a lot has probably at some point his path had kind of crossed with the uh, yes at some yes, point, and he was very right. complimentary about Bill Bruford and uh, mm -hmm. Fairport, as you pointed out, some uh, really good kind of folky kind of uh, UK Absolutely. folk there, late sixties, early seventies, yeah. uh, kind of a, a little uh, proggy too in there. A little I mean, proggy, they would kind of fall under that proggy umbrella, but yeah. maybe like a folk prog almost. Maybe, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So talented, talented man, and uh, very nice. Oh very talented drummer musician and uh well great great thrill to talk to so but um but we're back now here obviously you can tell it's a little different <laughs> you know but uh and he's got power back so all is, all is well in the world again and uh but anyways uh we just did notice that um this was what a couple days later uh a few days after the recording McCartney, the, the cassette from McCartney 3 was announced. Oh, so, the old trusty cassette. So it's 1989 all over again. We got vinyl, we got CDs, we got cassettes. And uh, last we oh, saw, boy. it's about 16.99 going I for. 50, yeah, 15.99, 16.99, something like that. So uh, sure, it'll we'll have that. I'm sure, listen, I'm sure it'll have that nice little analog tape hiss sound like Egypt Ooh. Station did. Yeah. Were you a cassette fan at all? I was, yeah. I didn't. I didn't actively yeah. buy. I didn't. I more bought you know vinyl and CDs. But if uh, if somebody right. had a case of cassettes, yeah, yeah, I, I collected them. Yeah. And still, and still yeah. do. You? Right. Yeah. And <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, it was funny because like the the eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety area when I was really you know getting into collecting music, I would always check CD first. If they didn't have CD, then I'd go to vinyl. If they didn't have it on vinyl, I'd get it on cassette. So at least I would had a copy of it you know, in, in three different mediums, you know, so. Sure. I think my early first McCartney cassette I ever owned was all the best. And that was like a revelation because that was like, wow, all the hits on one thing, you know. 
Yeah, and that was double cassette too, I would imagine. It wasn't actually. It was one. It wasn't. Oh, okay. It well, was you can one. get more time on a cassette though, can't you? I think you do, yeah. But uh, yeah, cassettes were like, hey man, just throw it in, Walkman, go. It was, you know, it's the forerunner of uh, CDs yeah. and later uh, iPods, and even those. Yeah. Are gone. <laughs> yeah, because I, you could probably fit. I mean, because what do you like, 45, 48 minutes, maybe 50 minutes? I know because there was a couple 60 minute tapes too, like the Maxell uh, cassettes. Yeah, they would. Some of them would do longer for five side. minutes, right? Or something but, like that. 45 per side was your standard for a 90-minute yeah. cassette. Right. And then, you, you know, I, I remember some cassettes coming out where you had an album on one side and another album on the other side. Yeah. Know? Yeah. No, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's cool that their they're, they're cassettes are coming back again. What's, what's yeah. old is new again. So yeah. McCartney 3 and a cassette, you know, Tom and I haven't ordered it yet, but you know we will. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be showing it off in a future episode. But... Annie, anything else you want to talk about before we sign off? Not much, no. The, another great guest. Uh, more to come. Uh, we're here. This is early, early. This is our first November show yep. um, for this month. So we've got an action-packed November and December, uh, rolling us into 2021. So stay tuned. Yeah, but you also did a guest spot on another show, didn't you? I did. I did. <laughs> I did. Didn't we talk about that in the last show? No, I'll just say, mention it one more time. Yeah, so I was a guest on our friend uh, Sam Wiles' podcast, uh, Paul or Nothing, and uh, we spoke for three and a half hours about the Return to Pepperland sessions with Phil Ramone, and some of our uh, Two Legs viewers and fans have listened to that and have wrote to us and uh, were very complimentary about my appearance on that show. Great. It's, uh, we did it over the course of a few nights, and uh, it was a blast talking to Sam about that. And appreciate uh, you know the exposure and having you know me go on there, and we'll definitely have Sam back on at some point as well. Yep, some point. Yep, absolutely. We also both of us did the guest spot on Martin Quibble's new podcast called Pods Like Us, which is a podcast about podcasts. This man listens to podcasts nonstop. He has his driving job, and he just you know what he does to help uh, you know waste the time, if you will, or or make the time go fast. Or he just listens to podcasts nonstop. So he came up with the idea to get talk about podcasts with his favorite podcast host. So we are fortunate enough to be a part of this first season that he's still working on. And I uh, had a great time talking about two legs and working with Andy, you know, working with David, my original co-host. So it was it was a lot of fun. And check that out. That's called Pods like us and i believe that's on poppings and itunes as well yes thank you so, martin thank thank you yes, martin and also a you. special shout out to um your former co-host uh, david gargolino i got a treasure trove of goodies in yes. the mail today <laughs> from him um so thank you so much for those david uh, the ensuing nights and weeks will be preoccupied going through those goodies right. so really appreciate that and all the extra stuff too so really thank I've, you very much I've gotten boxes and boxes of stuff from him over the years. Just I couldn't believe it. He uh, threw in so many other things I wasn't even thinking about. So it was really cool. So very appreciated. So thank you. Okay. And uh, I do want to give one last shout out to a uh, vinyl community member. Uh, his name is Matthew Street. Uh, a lot of you might know him for his YouTube channel, Matthew Street, which he does a lot of Beatles, a lot of solo Beatles, a lot of pop culture stuff. And right now he's really high on this band. They're called the Midnight Callers, this brand new album. I think this is their debut album. And they're also on that new John Lennon um, oh, uh, tribute the, album. Yeah, the one they've ever been. Yep. You know, on Gem Records. This is on Gem Records as well. Uh, as we all know, our, our buddy Ken Womack did the liner notes for that CD. So you can check that out. I, I haven't listened to this yet, but I'm, I plan on it. And uh, Matt, Matthew, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, you sent him this my way. He's been talking very highly of this on a lot of videos that he's been doing lately. So once again, thank you for that. Everybody, we have a new website. It's uh, twolegspodcast.com. You can go over there. That's where you can find all of our episodes. You can click on the link. that will take you right to our YouTube page. So please check that out. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our YouTube page. It's, it's growing and we want to continue to grow the uh the youtube page so please check that out instagram twitter facebook at two legs podcast check us out there uh email us at two legs podcast 
at gmail.com. That's how you can reach us as well. But that link is also on our uh, on our website, so uh, under contact. So please, if you have, if you want to talk, uh, give us a shout out. I'm on uh, Facebook as Tom Hunyadi, and he's on uh, Facebook as Andy Nichols. And uh, you can find us easy. We're everywhere. So uh, Instagram, or not, sorry, not Instagram, but iTunes, um, iHeartRadio, Podbean, uh, wherever. Amazon. Uh, Sp Amazon, Spot. I mean, we Spotify too, right? Yeah, yeah everything. Spotify. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, Andy, thank you for getting us on all of those, all of those platforms. We really appreciate it. And um, everybody out there. Thank you, all the people that, all the newcomers, thank you for coming in and taking the time to listen to our show. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are approachable. Please feel free to drop us a line. Like I said, two legs podcast at gmail.com. And as always, everybody out there, have a great day and a beautiful night. So long. to Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast, hosted by Tom Hanyadi and Andy Nichols, with musical contributions by Dylan.